covert DNA collection, human genetic modification, biohacking, gene editing, bioweaponry. It's all going on around us every day, but most of us know nothing about this shadowy world of genetics. From myself, Mark L. Watson. This is Double Helix. November 28th, 2018. The University of Hong Kong opened its doors for two and a half days to welcome 500 guests from around the world to the second annual International Summit on Human Genome Editing. Before the doors closed again, 80,000 more people had watched the webcast and nearly 1.8 million viewed the live video stream. The summit gathered together researchers, ethicists, policy makers, representatives from numerous faculties of scientific and medical academies, patient group representatives, and many, many others. The talks and discussions at the event were wide-reaching, covering all facets of the field. The newest advances were broadcast to the eager eyes and ears of the audience in the university and beyond and the newest applications were excitedly shared. Also present were voices from the religious and ethical perspectives, discussing the profound philosophical questions that human genome editing raises, what is termed bioethics. A young associate professor from the Department of Biology at the Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen in China that we'll call SusTech from here on in, had been booked to speak. He had a big announcement to make, and the summit was the ideal place to present it. The audience, whether in the university auditorium or watching online, were the exact collection of individuals that he wished to speak to the most. This information would pertain to them. His name was Hei Jiankui, a 34-year-old from Jinhua County and a brilliant young mind and talent at what he did. He finished his education in China before moving his work to the United States in 2007 and earning his PhD at age 26 from Rice University in Houston. So good was his work and so impressed was his mentor that he was invited as a postdoc fellow to Stanford University in California to work on the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing program. But in 2012, as part of the aforementioned Thousand Talents program, which we discussed a little earlier in the show, the Chinese managed to pull He Jiankui back onto Chinese soil and granted him not only the generous salary and the distinguished professor title, but also the permission to open up his own lab at SusTech. The CCP granted him one million yuan to start his own company, or actually companies. He began to gain publicity and notoriety within the genomics world, especially within China, and the Chinese Central Television Network publicly termed him the, quote, founding father of third generation genome editing. Third generation here refers to the approaches of gene sequencing, which follows on, of course, from what is known as second generation sequencing. With the second annual international summit on human genome editing fast approaching, He Jiankui was making his preparations for the big moment. His flights were booked, the hotel all sorted, and his presentation was going through its final few tweaks. 
But just 48 hours before those doors to the university opened to visitors, Zhang Kui's big bubble had burst. You see, to explain, before a clinical trial can be carried out in the medical or scientific communities, they are documented in what is called a clinical trials registry. It's done for many reasons, including to protect the researchers and also the data, and to prevent such things as publication bias where the results might not actually be accurately reported upon completion. It's not always mandatory, especially not everywhere in the world, but it is increasingly expected and it's becoming standardised. Indeed, some medical journals won't publish results unless the trial has been pre-registered. The big announcement that He Jiankui was due to make to the summit was the result of one of his latest gene editing trials. But the pre-registration information had already been published on the registry and one of the senior editors at the MIT Technological Review, Antonio Regalado, had found it. It's of course not really the done thing to break someone else's story. But this was a little different. The trials conducted by He Jiankui were shocking, and the results were a quite astounding step, not only in the world of genetics, but, frankly, for humankind. He Jiankui, it turns out, had been a very busy little bee indeed. The story began in earnest the previous year, the 10th of June, 2017. He Jiankui was holding a conference at his university. Many had come to listen to him and others speak, and in attendance were a young couple. They were named Grace and Mark, though these were pseudonyms. Their real identities have, even to this day, remained unconfirmed, so Grace and Mark is how we're going to refer to them too. Mark was HIV positive, while Grace was negative, and they had serious concerns about passing the virus down to their offspring should they become pregnant with a child, which they wanted to. He Jiankui offered them IVF, but with a condition. He would edit the genes of the embryo so as to isolate the part of the DNA which would develop the HIV virus, and then manufacture an innate immunity to it within the baby. Mark and Grace agreed, and the experiment, which is ultimately what it was, went ahead behind closed doors in near absolute secrecy. There were other couples, also recruited, all with the same HIV-positive father, set up. In China, you see, it's against the law for a man with known HIV to father a child using IVF. Now, it's worth pointing out here, though you can ascribe as much truth to this as you wish, and I'm certainly not here to raise any unfounded doubts, that He Jiankui's university, where the experiments were being carried out, Sus Tech, claimed they knew nothing about any of this. They said the research and the experiments were not commissioned nor approved by the university, and that He Jiankui was no longer on their payroll. In October 2018, so just the month before the Hong Kong summit where He Jiankui was about to speak, Mark and Grace gave birth to twin girls. They were called Lulu and Nana, though again these are pseudonyms and their real identities are closely guarded secrets. Both girls were declared as healthy and as normal as any other newborn babies. He Jiankui was overjoyed. His experiment had worked. He had successfully created the world's first edited babies. A third baby to one of the other sets of parents was also born a few weeks later, but of course the focus here remains on Lulu and Nana as they were indeed the first ones born. So when Antonio Regalado at the MIT Technological Review caught wind of the affair through the pre-registration documents, the proverbial shit hit the proverbial fan. He Jiankui's big moment at the Hong Kong Human Genome Editing Summit had been ruined. His news had leaked early. And there was uproar. 
He was left with no other choice but to try to claw back control of his own story. He recorded five quick videos for his own YouTube page and proceeded to make the big announcement there instead, explaining a little about the experiment and declaring that the entire thing, including the birth of the girls, was an overwhelming success. The science and medical communities were still reeling the following day, and the committee at the Hong Kong summit were unsure quite how to react. Still clouded by the storm, they allowed He Jiang Kui to take the stage as was originally planned. He stood in front of the crowd with a nervous smile on his face, his segment and presentation titled CCR5 Gene Editing in Mouse, Monkey and Human Embryos Using CRISPR-Cas9. He first apologised for the circus that the previous couple of days had become since his news broke prematurely. Then he spent the next 20 minutes or so explaining his work. The crowd listened in silence as he spoke, the questions on ethics and legality still swirling around the room. It was the first time He Jiang Kui had presented any of his work publicly, having previously preferred his YouTube channel as a method of presenting to his audience. Jennifer Doudna, the pioneering scientist who was pivotal in the development of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, who we spoke about in previous episodes, was sitting in the crowd that day, listening keenly. I was really horrified and stunned when he described the process he used, Doudna told Nature.com. Quote, it was so inappropriate on so many levels. After the presentation, Hay then spent another 40 minutes or so answering questions from the audience. But as much as he fielded questions and concerns from across the room, and he answered each of them to a degree, there were, and there still are, many questions left unanswered. Were the parents informed of the risks involved? Hay revealed that it wasn't just Mark and Grace, the parents of newborn Lulu and Nana, who'd participated in the experiment. Indeed, there were eight couples in total, all consisting of an HIV-positive father and the HIV-negative mother. One of the couples dropped out during the process, but the other seven remained. It's not entirely clear what happened to each of them, but at least one of the others went on to give birth to a genetically modified child. Mark and Grace were merely the first, making Lulu and Nana more significant. There were also multiple other embryos which hadn't been used, which had had the genes altered, and again it's unclear what happened to these once the IVF was successful. It's also unclear why he chose the CCR5 modification to target the HIV. That's exactly what the CCR5 protein does in the human body, but there are other, far more tried and tested ways of HIV prevention. Others asked why he chose to conduct the experiment with HIV-positive fathers instead of mothers, as it's the mother's genes that are far more likely to pass the virus down to a child. The community and the wider scientific world at large were horrified and deeply concerned. There were a few who heralded the experiment and the results as groundbreaking, calling He Jiang Kui a genius and a trailblazer. But largely, the work was almost universally condemned. Dr. Aben Kirksey from the University of Oxford, who we heard from in the last episode, also spoke at the Genome Summit in Hong Kong, and he was in the crowd that day when He Jiang Kui gave his big presentation. The big moment for me came in passing. So I was checking into a hotel uh, in Hong Kong. I was there as a, a delegate about to speak on the ethics panel on the Human Genome Summit. And somebody in the elevator told me that uh, uh, a, a scandal was breaking, that um, someone there staying in the same hotel had just created the world's first genetically modified babies. You know, and, and we were to talk about, in theory, how should we use these technologies as they're starting to mature? 
So, you know, I, I went up, I, I went to my hotel room and found the YouTube videos. And, uh, you know, at that stage, we're all kind of trying to figure out, you know, empirically what had happened, like what, what had been done. Um, and, you know, as, as uh, they announced his name from the stage, there's, there's this moment of, of silence. Like, you know, we all clap and politely are, are waiting and we're not sure that he's going to actually show up. There, there was like this pause. There was at least like two or three minutes between, you know, the clapping and and this door emerging. So I was sitting towards the front. Um, uh, he comes out with the security detail, sidles up to the podium and, and gives a talk that was very heavy and kind of uh, technical, um, uh, you know, detail. Um, and, uh, you know, I was able to get up to the microphone after after the talk and and ask a question that you know is still one of the central questions for me and you know uh my question was what's what's your sense of responsibility to these children who have emerged from from the experiment um interestingly you know the lab had made a, a pretty um I think concrete and profound commitment to the health and well-being of these children with um, a guarantee in the participant consent form that gave them an insurance plan that guaranteed them, you know, an insurance plan for the first 18 years of their life. But things got a little messy and complicated when Dr. Ho was detained. Um, basically, uh, the insurance company didn't want to uh, issue the plan initially because these children were not because the insurance company knew the ins and outs of the experiment, but simply because they were in the neonatal intensive care unit at that point. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's been kind of my fundamental concern is is the health and well being of the children, and and yeah, it was it was a zoo. Like reporters were swarming everywhere. Um, I later learned that Dr. Ha changed hotels three, if not four times in the course of those few days in, in Hong Kong. So he left the very swanky hotel that we were staying at, uh, Le Meridian, uh, uh, eventually ended up in, in the Best Western um, after, you know, <laughs> downgrading every time, I think. Bioethicist and professor at law at Stanford, Henry Greeley, declared that he, quote, unequivocally condemned the experiment and that it was amazing even worse than i first thought he said the proverbial shit had as i said truly hit the fan and the pressure to act on the authorities with the means to do so was mounting rapidly on the night of the 26th of November, 122 Chinese scientists released a joint statement condemning the ethics of He Jiankui's experiment. They described it as crazy and a huge blow to the reputation of Chinese science. The Scientific Ethics Committee of the Academic Divisions of the Chinese Academy of Sciences posted a statement declaring their unequivocal opposition to the use of genome editing technology and practice on human embryos, stating that, quote, the theory is not reliable, the technology is deficient, the risks are uncontrollable, and ethics and regulations prohibit the action. Those who had previously spoken out in support of the experiment and the idea of genetically modified designer babies quickly fell quiet as a series of investigations and inquiries began to be launched. Local authorities began to look into the legalities of it all. Hayes University, the university where the experiment was carried out, SUSTEC, launched their own inquiry too and very quickly made a public statement. Their claims were that none of He Jiankui's research and lab work was carried out on the university property, and that none of what he was doing had been brought to the attention of the facility. They added that no part of it was sanctioned nor approved by SUSTEC, and that after an assessment by the Academic Committee of the Department of Biology, it had been concluded that his work was in serious violation of academic ethics and standards. Within three days, the Chinese authorities declared that He Jiankui's work was, quote, extremely abominable in nature, and that it was found to be in contravention of Chinese law. His research privileges were stripped from him, his practicing licenses suspended, and he was kept in a closely monitored facility used to surveil him whilst a decision was reached on what action should be taken, and then a ruling made. China, it seemed 
was standing firm against such awful violations of medical ethics, and indeed laws. They were keen, whilst the eyes of the world were watching them, to make an example of He Jiankui, and to publicly show that China did not approve of, nor willingly participate in, experimental sciences on living human beings without their consent, whether they were already born or not. One of the things that, that, that I found in um, doing this book is that uh, some of the initial statements were profoundly misleading about the health of these children at birth. Um, so while um, the, the videos that went out on YouTube claimed that they were as healthy as any other babies, I found that they were born at, at 31 weeks, um, you know, at, at a, a stage in pregnancy where it's you're you're going to have a viable child, but only if you have the very intensive um, modern neonatal intensive care apparatus. So these children were in the hospital um, that they, they wouldn't have survived if, if they were born you know, out, outside of a modern hospital setting. But would you put that down to the modifications that had been made to the embryo? Would you put it down to the fact that it was an IVF implantation that created the pregnancy or both? So really good question. And, and I think it's it's impossible to say from this this case of, of you know, one, one twin birth. So we know that... Um, so there were others, though. There were other births. There's three, right. So so the first two that were born, nicknamed Lulu and Nana, were born significantly prematurely. And we know that um, that IVF has a risk of, of, you know, producing premature births and that also twin pregnancies are extremely risky. Um, so in, in just looking at the way that the clinical... Uh, uh, uh setting was handled you know I, I think it was it was a poor clinical choice to implant multiple embryos at once so you know one of one of my key sources in the lab was was really concerned that this wasn't safety first research safety first research would implant one embryo at a time and um wait to see how things went and you know slowly proceed with with other pregnancies Two months later, almost to the day, on the 29th of January 2019, Hay was fired from his position at Sustec, and all his outstanding research projects were terminated completely. The official state news agency of China, Xinhua News, another arm of the CCP and one of its main tools in its arsenal of disinformation and repression, released a report stating that He had deliberately and repeatedly, quote, violated ethics, scientific research integrity, and relevant state regulations causing adverse effects at home and abroad. The case was handed to the National Security Department, and He Jiankui was kept in his safe house under surveillance as he faced criminal charges. It took nearly the entirety of 2019 to present the case, but in December of that year, He Jiankui was sentenced to three years in prison and a fine of three million Chinese yuan, around 430,000 US dollars. The scientific world was largely in agreement that it was the right outcome and most importantly, it had sent a message to others. Such rebellious acts of medical and scientific endeavour would not be tolerated, the groundbreaking work that the likes of Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier and the many others had spent their careers working towards were at risk of being undermined entirely by such cavalier uses of CRISPR application. The incredible future of such things should be protected. The research fine-tuned so that we can use it to save the human race no less. China wanted the world to see that it shared that vision. So it came as some surprise, though perhaps not, that by February the following year, so only a couple of months later, and still months before Hay was actually imprisoned, STAT got their hands on a number of documents which showed that the Chinese authorities, including the science ministry, had been involved in funding Hei Jiankui's study, which had led to the birth of the twin girls. Researchers and members of the scientific community had been quietly circulating their suspicions since the announcement had been made. 
Many believed that there was no way that the entire thing had been done under everyone's noses in complete secrecy and without any authority knowing about it. And they were now seemingly correct. There was no way that it had all been done without the authorities knowing. And not only were there various bodies and authorities who had been aware of what He Zhang Kui had been doing, but also that much of his funding had come from above too. If the documents were correct, then it would show that China not only lied on their official report, which states clearly that He and his lab acted entirely autonomously and without the consent, approval or funding of any governing body, not even his own university. Then they also claim he actually forged the necessary signatures on the informed consent form. But it also showed that the Chinese were knowingly involved in research, which the large majority of the rest of the world deemed highly unethical. But when the eyebrows had been raised, they simply threw their scapegoat straight under the bus, another disposable asset to the Chinese superpower. So I think that the Chinese Communist Party, like any big organization, is, you know, it's composed of individuals. And I, I think there's in some ways a tension that came to head between different factions of the party with this incident, you know. President Xi and kind of his 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 team have been very much pushing, you know, a neoliberalist capital agenda, a pro-technology agenda. But there's older members of, of the party that have different values, that value more, you know, a sense of prudence, a sense of doing the right thing at the right time. So, you know, he did have his supporters in the party and those people quickly backed away. But, you know, there was a lot of people in the party who either probably most people in the party didn't know that this was happening. I think it was it was a tiny select few, you know, genuinely I, were. Yeah, I can I can point to one or two people in Beijing who were across the experiment, um, some influential m municipal officials in Shenzhen. So Shenzhen is like Sil the Silicon Valley of China. So it's no small thing that you have, you know, major players in the Shenzhen scene backing you. But um, yeah, I, I think most of the party as a whole had no clue that this kind of stuff was taking place. And, and there was a real tension. And, and you saw some very quick reforms. You saw you know, new regulations specific to gene editing being put into place. You have new um, you know, review panels for other kinds of frontier technologies and disruptive technologies being put into place. So yeah, I, I think, you know, the CPC is not this like homogenous, um, you know, monolith, but it's it's an organization composed of individuals, individuals who might have, you know, different uh, things that they're they're wanting to support, different agendas, and, and in some cases, fundamentally different values. You know, there's, there's still members of the Communist Party who are um, uncomfortable with the way that capitalism has come to kind of dominate, uh, you know, society and, and, and the nation in China, and, and would like to see a return to earlier socialist values. Hank Greeley, the lawyer from Stanford University, puts it neatly when asked about the ethical fallout of the case and what steps can be taken to prevent this sort of thing happening again. Quote, it's hard in the best of cases, he said in an interview with Stat. And he goes on to say, quote, it's really hard when you have 1.3 billion people spread out over a large area. Whether or not this will spark some sort of reform, or whether this will simply be a missed opportunity to do so and is simply the very tip of only one iceberg, remains to be seen. What does remain from the event, and from the fallout of it, what conversations we're left having, is one which sits in a form of duality. We have the absolute, undeniable praise, acclaim and hope that the technologies are brought into our world. The advancements made over these years and the unquestionable advancements which will be made as we move forward into a brighter future have created a framework where things are possible that could only have been dreamed of before. Lives will be saved. Lives will be bettered. And as Eben Kirksey said, if we can reach a place where the availability of it all can benefit everyone, and we will, then it will rightly be regarded as one of the most important scientific and medical innovations of all time. But with it, 
as with all things, comes a risk of abuse. With great power comes great responsibility, as we often hear. That's a quote from the French philosopher Voltaire, and not, as it's more commonly claimed, Spider-Man. The same, of course, can be said for most aspects of modern medicine and medical practice. A great deal of trust is put into our medical professionals and nearly all act with the necessary integrity that we require of them. And it's also worth stating, in case my conclusion of this has been misinterpreted, that I believe Hei Zhengkui thought he was acting with integrity too. He didn't set out to cause a firestorm. Far from it. And his work is valuable to the bigger picture, whether we like to admit it or not. But there are ways of turning genetics to a far more lethal end than that. Far more. You see, we haven't even started the conversation on bioweaponry. That's for next time. Double Helix was written and produced by myself, Mark Watson. Sound design is produced with credit to Looper Man and Pixabay. I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the show, and to all my guests who kindly gave up time from their busy schedules to speak with us. And I'd like to thank you, too, the listener. Without your support, none of this would be possible. You can find more content and follow my work at marklwatson.co.uk or by searching anywhere online. Thank you for listening, and please go and dig deeper on everything that has been discussed in this show. There is so much more yet to uncover.